Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have a special guest. He goes by the handle Terpene Therapy. He has a podcast called Terpene Therapy Podcast. His name's Casey, and uh, he wanted Carrie. to come on. Carrie. Yeah, no, my listen, fault if there. I, listen, if I had a dollar for every time someone had uh, called me Casey, I'd probably be living on an island somewhere where you couldn't get in contact with me. <laughs> no, perfect. So, yeah, Carrie, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on. Oh, listen, I appreciate the opportunity to be on here. It's nice to meet you as well. And um, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, you want to just go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, yeah, of topic. course. Yeah. Yeah. So what is a terpene for those listening? I don't even fully know what it is. Oh, so, yeah, okay. explain. Yeah, okay, listen, we'll get into this. And so, yeah, essentially, I guess uh, what I what I do is, is run a podcast called uh, Terpene Therapy. And terpenes are um, the volatile chemicals uh, within nature that help provide the many different smells um, and I guess olfactory experiences that you can get in relation in my podcast in particular it's to uh, the cannabis terpene profiles um, because you know the cannabis plant is one of the it's really the only plant in my opinion that can exhibit such a wide variety of aromatic experiences um, from the same genetic base. You know, it's a, you get the same plant material, the same stalk, same flower, same leaf structure, but you have, I mean, at this point, I've probably tried 30, 40 different flavors of cannabis. So it's, it's, it's like, and, and there's new ones being bred every single week due to these uh, wonderful genetic artists out here who uh, really have passion for seeking out rare flavors you know but uh yeah so, terpene is just a you know it's just a aromatic compound interesting yeah. yeah i was actually looking up a picture and it showed like it was like a cannabis leaf and then all these different compounds like the mm -hmm. percentage of like maybe by the density in some sense like when you're distilling it or explain how all this works like, okay so when you want to think about terpenes in relation to cannabis and in particular cannabis consumption so um you want to you want to picture it in a uh by weight percentage uh so you know typically with uh, a cannabis flower you'll see anywhere from one to six percent terpenes by volume and this is mainly comprised of a uh, profile of terpenes that help identify a particular strain. So you might have a strain that tastes like, uh, let's see, back on the table back there, I've got one that uh, tastes like papaya, so more of like a sour fermented fruit. Um, we've also got one back there that tastes like um, sort of like an earthy, like if you walk into a forest and you've smelled like fresh soil and all the, you know, the pine trees and every, it's like an earthy, piney kind of flavor. Um, you know, those are all different terpene profiles. So different combinations of terpenes that are presented by the plant to uh, create these different flavors. And, you know, supposedly they moderate the effects of the cannabinoids in the body as well. So it's... Um, you know, that's kind of the reason why different strains have different effects. You might have strains with similar levels of active cannabinoids like THC, CBD, CBD, whatever. Uh, but you have a, or they might have similar levels of those cannabinoids, but you have a different terpene profile in the mix. You might have the THC interacting with the cannabinoid receptors in different parts of the body. It might go to the bones. It might go to the... Uh, soft tissues it might go to the brain you know there's different ones that make strains act differently and that you know i find it interesting so i kind of wanted to you know make a podcast around that i suppose <laughs> interesting and so yeah each one of those terpene profiles might give a different experience and that's kind of what you were explaining mm -hmm. these right. terpenes are found in nature that are chemicals that provide different experiences based off of whatever their profile happens to be. And so you might be searching for a flavor or an experience or just a feeling from any of those. Is that kind of right? Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And it's the reason why you might get a, um, 
more stimulating effect from one strain of cannabis versus a more sedating effect from another strain of cannabis. Um, I usually look at the cannabis effect as sort of a spectrum where you have stimulating on one side, sedating on the other, and you know everything can kind of fall somewhere in between. Um, I like to use that in versus sativa and indica because those are really outdated terms that don't hold much uh, precedence in terms of like the modern cannabis environment. Sure. Because I mean, and everyone's uh, heard of sativa and indica, but that's really not, it doesn't mean all that much. Sure. Yeah. Like it gets way more complicated than that. It's like someone saying, do you like wine or beer? And it's mm -hmm. like, well, I like specific things based off specific things. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? No, well, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I had this DNA expert on like a genetic kind of specialist and mm -hmm. he, he made me think about how each individual has an own set of genes and it probably will react differently to these different terpenes that you're explaining because it's like, you know, yes. what, a terpene that you might love and the experience you get is amazing. Another person might be like, mm, not for me. And it's just so interesting how the brain mixed with these chemicals can yield so many different, uh, you know, outcomes. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the reason why you have uh, some people where – you know, certain strains might cause more anxiety than other strains. Um, you know, it's, it, it's really a fascinating thing. And being a human being uh, is really fascinating as well because we have this potential to, um, you know, input these compounds into our system, see what the outcome is. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it, it involves having fun, <laughs> at sure. least in my experience. Yeah. No, yeah. And so what first got you interested in all this, like marijuana or terpenes or the decomposition? Or I, I forget what the word might be, okay, distillation. So the, uh, I guess really what got me interested in it, um, you know, I've always been, I've always been interested in things that um, can alter the way that our uh, bodies perceive this external reality. And I was always raised in a very, uh, a very open-minded type of uh, environment. Not necessarily a pro-drug environment because I don't. I'm not necessarily a pro-drug type of person. I don't believe that they are good or bad, needing to be promoted or not promoted. You know, they're just simply there in our in our world. Um, you know, so. You know, as a child, I've always been interested in all types of different things. And then getting older, you know, you, you're hanging out with your friends and they're like, oh, man, well, we got some weed. Well, let's let's smoke it and get high. And then I realized at that point that it kind of worked like a key fitting into a lock where, um, you know, I I don't know. I guess I've been diagnosed with ADD in my lifetime and I feel like cannabis might help with equalizing whatever is going on with that. You know, I don't, I think that the, uh, the whole thing with that is such a really, really complex issue that, uh, all I know is that cannabis seems to work well in terms of, uh, managing that. And I found that out at about 14 years old. And ever since then, you know, we've been just keeping it moving, keeping it going. And, uh, you know, it's 12 years ago and I don't see any signs of slowing down anytime soon because the, uh, train keeps on rolling. So I can't stop. And well, you know, I don't like to put it like that, but I think that, uh, the, the, the benefits that I get versus the other drugs that I was using throughout my life, you know, the cannabis seems to be the one that works really well in terms of a, uh, you know, like a, like a maintenance type of thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I really liked how you said, you know, drugs aren't good or bad. Maybe the word drug is just too broad of a word in general, but it's like, I come from a community that was less open-minded by far. Like mm -hmm. I went to this private Christian school from preschool to 12th grade and weed was never discussed, you know, psychedelics, you know, drugs were categorized into one thing and that was a bad thing. And that a lot of people had a reactionary phase of like, what do you mean they're all bad? Let me try it. And then, oh, it's really not that bad. And like, you know, but like you were saying, maybe there were some drugs you were doing that truly uh, did have a net negative. And so it's like, that's why I'm a huge fan of like promoting these kinds of discussions because it's like, 
I hate when people that are older than me, like the generations above, say, "Oh, he's using drugs." I'm like, "Bro, caffeine is a drug. Stop talking." I don't I don't yeah. like when people categorize it in that simplistic of a term. And so I was just curious, so what other drugs have you experienced? Oh, I mean, it'd be easier to kind of give you a list of what I haven't. But um, I'd say just in terms of, uh, you know, category or, or um, yeah, categories of compounds, you know, cannabis and cannabinoids, then you've got psychedelics, um, stimulants. I was a real big fan of, but I do not live that life anymore at all because it is not productive nor conducive to being healthy or happy on this planet. Um, you know, opioids, never really a big fan of, uh, kind of boring and just, you know, sure euphoria, I guess, but you know, the sick, you know, the sick feeling that you get is not really good. Um, dissociatives, I am a fan of, uh, those are like ketamine and like fencyclidine and DXM, things like that. Um, yeah, man, I guess uh, benzos never really cared for either. The yeah, I'm not a downer person. Yeah, if you can tell that. But um, yeah, pretty much all all of those. Uh, the ones that I have, you know, kept going forward with, and the ones that I see taking me into the future. Not necessarily taking me into the future because that's giving too much responsibility to the compound, whereas the responsibility lies within myself. Um, but the ones that I see, you know, that, that help me maintain a uh, productive mindset, uh, probably, you know, just cannabis and psychedelics. Yeah. Okay. Would be the ones that uh, I prefer out of all of it. You know, y you try them all, figure out what's going on. All of them, in my opinion, are pretty much trash compared to uh, cannabis and psychedelics. And I'll throw dissociatives in there with psychedelics because they're an atypical psychedelic. But um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What psychedelics have you experienced and what was oh, your favorite? We got, uh, favorite? Oh, favorite. Um, that's really hard to... Oh, ooh, actually, no, it's not. Mescaline. Mescaline, hands down. Um, you know, that is... Uh, has one that has the longest history of use in humans. Uh, 5,500 years, give or take. Um, been used by Native American populations uh, where it... And uh, th uh, throughout uh, North, Central, and South America... Um, grows, nat it's a naturally occurring alkaloid, uh, occurs in several cacti species. You know, you've got your peyote, your San Pedro, Peruvian torch, um, and those all contain, you know, notable amounts of mescaline. Uh, it's really, you know, in my opinion, that's the one that, uh, is the most guiding, I would say. The, the other, you know, the, and, and, yeah, the other ones kind of force you to be in a certain place. Mescaline kind of takes your hand and shows you why you need to be in the place. That's well yeah. said. Interesting. I've never tried it. Maybe one day. It's very, yeah. very, very uh, uncommon. But you know, we can, we can, uh, we can figure that out. You know, after we get off the recording, of course. But uh, yeah, the the mescaline is not very common. But in my opinion, it is. Uh, has a lot of good potential for, for interesting people. yeah and i guess what would you say like do would you say weed could be a form of psychedelic like do you ever categorize it in a similar or maybe like a side subset or is it completely different in your mind so i'm glad you asked this question because i think it's important for the listeners to even understand what the word psychedelic means in this yeah instance. and so if you don't mind we can we can get into that a little bit mm, uh, definitely. The, co the coin or the coin the uh sorry I, I i will not lie i took a dab earlier so the wires are getting crossed the uh the uh, term was coined um, by the British Canadian psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond in uh, 1956, and it essentially, the word means producing an expanded consciousness through a heightened awareness of feeling, um, and it is, uh, I guess the etymology of the word is from the Greek psyche, meaning mind, and delon, meaning make visible or to reveal. And so essentially it means revealing the mind or mind manifesting is another way that uh, it can be translated. So really these compounds, any, any compound that has the ability to alter the perception 
of um, your external reality can, in a sense, be considered psychedelic, but also, you know, words have societal meanings as well. And so within our modern context, you know, psychedelic often means something that creates a profound mental, visual sensation experience, you know, sensory experience, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it, essentially, I think any compound can be a psychedelic. Cannabis, for sure, can be a psychedelic, especially if you have a low tolerance and you take a very high dose very quickly. Um, you know, I don't personally know. It's, it's been a long time for me since I've experienced the psychedelic side of cannabis, but that's not what I use it for. Um, you know, I use it as a uh, maintenance tool, not a uh, psychedelic. You know, I've got various other tools in my toolkit for that. Yeah, that's interesting. You said the Greek roots were psyche, like, you know, like the internal conscious in some sense. And what was mm -hmm. the other part of it? Explain uh, that again. Uh, okay. Uh, de, de Lune, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, it is, I can spell it. It's uh, D-E-L-O-U-N. And that means to make visible and to reveal. So essentially uh, revealing of the mind or mind manifesting in a way is a good, is a good way to think about uh, the word psychedelic in relation to how it can be applied to a compound that you would ingest. Man, that's really interesting. Yeah. I've heard some people explain their experiences while on psychedelics as somewhat a divine experience because there, an inner voice is yeah. being forced to be listened to in some sense. And it's like, it depends on how you define God, but in some ways, God could be that conscious voice that's telling us how to live in some sense. And I don't know, I just, I find an interesting little connection there. I'm not sure what your thoughts are there, but. So in my opinion, oh, it, yeah, with the religion and psychedelics thing, I mean, how far do you want to go back in human history? Uh, do you want to get into the burning bush with, uh, you know, acacia being a native bush or tree to that uh, Mount Sinai area? And, you know, acacia happens to, most species of acacia contain anywhere from 1% to 3% weight DMT concentration. So, you know, if that might get struck by lightning and you go breathe in a bunch of that smoke from the tree, who knows what could happen. You might realize we should all stop being a dick to each other and try to get along and live with the earth. But that, you know, doesn't that sound kind of like the Ten Commandments? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's... And if you, if you look up the geographical concentration of where those where that plant is especially around that time period you have a lot you said more the acacia plant yes uh the acacia tree uh there's okay. several species of acacia that contain uh dmt in their uh in their bark and their roots you know just throughout the plant mm. but you're saying they were a lot of them are in that geographic location so they're actually all over the world but there is a concentration of them around the area where the story took place you know interesting yeah huh. so I've, and i and i think that you know there is a great correlation between the feeling that you get some sometimes on because every, every trip is different but sometimes you get this feeling of connectedness with the entire thing you know with with every with it essentially with all and um you know, it, it, as to the validity of that experience, I can't confirm it or, or deny it. You know, it's, it's everyone has their own belief on it. But I do think that's the closest a human being can get to experiencing what uh, what God is or the, the Christian ideology or Jewish ideology or Muslim ideology of God. Um, you know, those those sort of Abrahamic religions, I believe, are all based around tryptamine experiences. Um yeah, I don't know. It's really it's really interesting. And I will say personally, uh, yeah, I uh especially more so with mushrooms. Mm. Those uh, you know, there's something going on with the uh with the I guess god thing with the mushrooms especially. Mescaline's more like a grandfather. Man, interesting. Yeah, like I just the way you said it like, hmm, maybe if more people, you know, smoked a little bit of that dmt from the plant 
maybe they would stop being less, they would be less of a dick to other people and maybe realize the importance and value that they have on this earth and that every action they have can truly impact people in a positive or negative way. And it kind of shows you, hmm, how are you going to act today, tomorrow, and the next day? How are you going to treat your mom? How are you going to treat your friend? How are you mm -hmm. going to treat your significant other? And it's like, it shows you how connected you are to, like you said, the universe and the world, but also to other people. And you're also connected to your future self and your past self. It just, oh, yeah. in my mind, it just, it shows me this, like, how important life is. And a lot of people have a perception of, hmm, these people who are taking all these drugs, they're just degenerates, waste space, they just party, they don't care about life. And it's like, wait a minute, when's the last time you ever talked with someone who's tried these drugs and asked them how they really feel about it and how they really feel about life? Mm -hmm. So I also, too, have been a degenerate and a waste of space and partied quite a bit. Um, I think that a human being has the potential for all of those things within their lifetime. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 but, but I do agree in what you're saying and that I think spreading a more positive message towards these compounds or drugs, whatever you want to call them. I believe a drug is a compound that is ingested to produce some sort of desirable uh, outcome. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, a, it, you know, I really, I really am glad that uh, there's, a, there's more people that are starting to kind of see the light when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, especially with the with it, with mushrooms, I know up in Michigan uh, and other, you know, I think Colorado and Oregon and uh, I believe in Boston as well. Now they're decriminalized, and so uh, it's a uh, you know it's it's something we're going to be seeing more and more people are going to have access. So that means more people need to be educated. Yeah, and it's kind of inspiring that like podcasts like Joe Rogan or Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris and all these big names are really talking about the importance maybe of these compounds and how maybe doing them in a safe environment in the right mind state mind space you can really generate such an outcome that could better your life and how some of the research shows that even just one big experience on mushrooms for example can be one of the pivotal moments in someone's life, a moment that they look back on regularly and how it's like at on the same level of having a kid or being married those days and how it's like, hmm, I look back on this day all the time as a lesson, as motivation. And that's how it's been for me. And that's why I'm like, I want to talk about this on my podcast. Like I've gotten a lot of people who are like, <laughs> you know, might think of Harley as this druggy kid who, you know, is too open-minded and should stop talking about these things. But I'm like, you know, the future is going to, like, like you're saying, it's becoming more and more decriminalized. And in my opinion, educating people on the best way to do it, the best mind state to be in, the best environment, you know, educating people, the importance of having someone you can trust while doing it, all of these mm -hmm. things, set, setting, you know, environment, all of it, and how, like you were saying, showing people how long these drugs have been used. It's like these drugs have been used for thousands of years. And, oh, oh yeah. for the past hundred years, they've been banned. But it's like hmm. we have hmm. evolved to why. almost use these plants. But, yeah, explain what you were thinking. Oh, well, it's just it's very curious that, um, you know, when you have a uh, – compound that has been banned it's always curious to is you, is you wonder why simply because it's it's just a molecule i mean it's not actively doing anything but maybe it has great potential for uh changing the way that the orders of things are in the world um that being said i don't know so i, I have conflicting views on this because i do believe that um i I do believe that, yes, the powers that be would like to keep these things under wraps and, you know, out of the hands of people who use them safely and responsibly and sort of shove it to the side and make it disenfranchised and sort of give it a public negative perception. Um, also, on the other side of the coin, it might just be ignorance uh, of people making laws who are just being pressured by outside in, outside financial interests who want to you know control 
the way things are from their end. Um, you know, it might, it might not do a society so well if we had power to, you know, take control of our own mental and physical health and realize that we have the power to do that, realize that we are the ultimate source of creation, not that there is a separation between the God or us, that we are it. You know, if you, if you allow a person to really understand that and you allow a collective of people to really understand that, I think the illusion of control goes out the window. But at the same time, you know, these con it's like you said, these compounds have been used in humans for thousands of years why not try and see what good potential they could possibly bring our species especially in a time like now you know where we're a little bit maybe circling the drain yeah yeah that's well said it's like i, I love how you were nuanced and showed both sides of the coin there where it's like you know well you have to look at both sides of the coin because the coin exists mm, that's really well said yeah like yeah. You know, we live in a society where, you know, some kind of drugs are totally okay. Let's go to the pharmacy and pick up the newest prescription that the doctor said I should take. And it's like, oh, that's totally socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a profit driven business. Whereas, oh, I want to go out and into nature and explore the plants that nature has to offer. You know, no one's really profiting. And so it's like, you're right. Who knows why these drugs are being pushed to the side? One of my thoughts is that some people are truly terrified of what these drugs can do. Like some people, they like having only viewing reality from a, from a few lenses, like the sober lens or maybe with alcohol. But, you know, diving into all these other uh, lenses to look at reality can sometimes almost be overwhelming. And oh, I, and I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. And I can see like a balance of like. In my opinion, I don't think everyone should be tripping every day all the time because it's like, I don't know, I don't think society would work in that way because sometimes it's, it's nice to take an occasional look at reality from another lens, but if you're constantly not looking at reality from a sober lens, I feel like there's going to be errors that you're going to make in life. And so that's kind of why I'm a big fan of like the idea of balance where it's like, how about you try a sauna and a cold plunge as a drug as well because that that's also a drug in my eyes. I do that mm -hmm. daily, and I'm that's kind of what I do. And so it's like yeah. I want to I want to promote this idea of like you can be a very healthy person, a person who has a ton of potential, who will use those substances on the occasion to better their mental state, improve their perspective, etc. But it's like I also don't want people to use that as a crutch for the only thing that gets them through life. So it's like it's an interesting balance and. So I don't know exactly how yeah. this education well, should play out, but I think that what it really comes down to, and I, I, I really enjoy what you just said because it, it, it rings true to me. You know, I think that, uh, it's, well, it's, it's something that I almost, I can't kind of say comment on it too much because I don't do the sober thing. Um, very often I will say, I guess if you're counting consistent, like hash smoking, because that is the deal that I've signed with myself, and I fully understand that. But I do believe that um, you do need to kind of, with the other things that aren't weed, if you're not a weed person, every other drug definitely commands a whole lot more respect. Um, and so it is good to, it's like you're saying, you shouldn't be tripping every day. For uh, There's honestly a couple of reasons. One yeah. is for the mental thing. Uh, because part of the psychedelic experience is the integration period that occurs after the drug has been metabolized and exited the body and allows, and, and so it's the following five to 10, you know, up to two weeks after a psychedelic experience in most cases that I have uh, personally experienced and seen throughout my life. Um, you know, if you don't have the integration phase, there is no positive outcome really you're just kind of like chasing the you're chasing something telling you something rather than trying to implement that and to see what sort of positive outcomes you can do in your whole life two which is a more important thing you shouldn't be tripping every day because these compounds are not without their physical dangers you know people mm. like to say that psychedelics are 
harmless to the body. They're not toxic to the body. They don't cause any sort of physical negative side effects. And uh, we're coming to realize it's simply just not true. Um, especially, and this is one thing I want to bring up with people who are microdosing, um, especially if you have a regiment where you are taking microdoses four times or more a week or even three times a week. Um, you know, look up uh, VHD, which is valvular heart disorder. And there is a strong correlation between drugs that bind to the 5-HT2B receptor and the um, increased risk and occurrence of uh, VHD, essentially. And so What's it's VHD? really... VHD? VHD is uh, it's a heart disease that you can get. Um, it's essentially a enlarged heart muscle from overstimulation of a 5-HT2B, which is a type of serotonin receptor that is located on the heart muscle. And so when you take drugs that bind to the serotonin receptors, they also bind not just in the brain, but throughout the body to other serotonin receptors. Some of those are on the heart muscles and can cause ex excessive stimulation of the muscle tissue, leading to an increased and enlarged heart, which, you know, that's not good. I'm not sure beyond why that's not good, but I would imagine that, you know, blood clots, um, heart attacks, you know, you're, you're at risk for several cardiac events uh, at that point, more so than you would be if you practice moderation. And it's like you're saying, maybe utilizing a strong trip once every month or two, and then maybe a supplemental microdose in between that. Um, you know, I think that it's important to really take a dive and to look into all the aspects and the pharmacodynamics pharmaco did i say that right pharmacodynamics yes of uh whatever compound you're taking um yeah it's important man that's it's really well said it's like i didn't know about that and not a lot I'm of sure people most do. people do yeah. most people probably don't because no one talks about this you know mm -hmm. coming back to the point of like why it's so important to discuss these things and i was also curious did you do you see any risks of like consistent cannabis use Oh, people. I mean, yeah, so smoking is not good for you, first of all. It'll hurt your lungs. You can develop cancers of the lungs, throat, mouth, whatever. Um, smoking's bad for you, you know. Everyone knows that. Um, for people that are of higher risk of maybe uh, anxiety or other um, imbalances within their mental state, uh cannabis might not be the best fit for them personally, but also there are people who use cannabis to help with their chronic anxiety. So it really, in my opinion, it comes down to uh, an individual case by case basis. I can't say that what will be bad for one person might not occur for another person. You know, everyone's body metabolizes drugs differently, interacts with drugs differently, but smoking is bad regardless of what it is. And uh, so, you know, if you like to eat your weed, you know, it might be good. Sure, but personally, yeah. I'm impatient. <laughs> no, yeah. Like, I've heard that the ingesting uh, through the edible form is even like a different type of drug entirely in some sense. Yeah, well, uh, not even in some sense. It just becomes metabolized through the liver. So you have Delta 9 THC. Uh, becoming metabolized through the liver into 11 hydroxy THC. And, you know, I'm mm. about to turn into Joe Rogan on this one, but, you know, 11 Heck hydroxy yeah. THC is, uh, it's, um, you know, just a more psychoactive version of THC. It's got a higher binding affinity to the uh, cannabinoid receptor in the body, and it also sticks in the receptor a lot longer, so you get more stoned and for longer. Um uh, yeah, I like edibles. They're cool. Yeah, that's interesting. But don't and mix the edibles and psychedelics unless you really know what you're doing because that can go off the wall very, very, very quickly. Yeah, I probably never will do that, honestly. Hmm. Both of them are crazy enough on their own, in my opinion. Or, yeah. Well, I like a little bit of both, but you got to really understand what territory you're stepping into. Sure. And... Tell me about your first experience with weed and psychedelics, either one or both. Oh, interesting. Okay, so weed is uh, – we can go ahead and get that one out of the way because it's really not all that uh, interesting. You know, we're just down at the skate park and uh, – or like 
let's smoke some weed. So we, you know, it's a skate park. You know, it's not that hard to find weed. You just go around and be like, hey, where do I get the weed at? And they're like, you know, so you go get you some weed. And then uh, I think we were sitting, if anyone's familiar with the skate park in downtown Louisville, they used to have a half pipe there. And we'd sit on those stairs. And uh, I guess this is one thing I will say. Uh, we rolled up a blunt. And so don't smoke blunts. That is one thing that I'm vehemently against is tobacco use, smoking blunts. You know, there's just no, if you like to smoke weed, smoke your weed. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? If you got a nicotine addiction, you know that's a different thing. But that's something that a person will have to handle on their own. Um, so, yeah, we just rolled up a blunt, which is a disgusting thing in my opinion. And Why? Well, you know, have you ever looked at how a blunt is made? Uh, not really. Oh, exactly. If you knew, then you probably wouldn't be smoking them. Uh, like how the paper is made? Well, it's not paper. It's, it's pressed tobacco pulp with antifungal sprays and anti-molding or like a anti uh there's something else that they spray on it that prevents like bacteria growth there's um you know what are the what are the compounds that they're using to flavor the blunts that you're smoking mm. and if you're mm. smoking if you if you're smoking good weed it should taste like what you're trying to imitate with the blunt you know i could go get a jar that tastes like tangerines i could go get a jar that tastes like strawberry you know and that's just the weed. Yeah, and you don't need to go through all those chemicals and also no, the, and the nicotine the tobacco. Too. It's yeah, like why why develop an addiction to something that doesn't get you high? Yeah, that's only like a few seconds long. And yeah, see, luckily that's never something I've I've done in my life. Is nicotine. me neither. Yeah, well that's good, man. That's good. Yeah, but um, yeah, I uh, so I guess with the weed, you know, mm. it, we just we got high, and uh, I realized that I really liked graffiti in that moment. That it's the the voice of the people. And then I realized that my brain was very quiet and I didn't have like a bunch of different things competing for my attention hierarchy in my mm. brain. And so um, for people with uh, ADD and ADHD, uh, the attention hierarchy oftentimes gets flattened out. So for neurotypical people, you have um, your highest priority and then you've got events that take less priority and you're able to accomplish those events in terms of their uh, you know, needing to be done. For someone with ADD, the priority hierarchy gets flattened out. And so everything has an equal amount of attention and importance in the brain. And so it's hard to differentiate what task you need to get done, therefore leading to starting 10 things and mm. having a big pile of nothing <laughs> done. Yeah, I've had that before. <laughs> yeah, which is a, a frustrating place and it leads to guilt and sadness overall. You know, you can't live that. You can't live those patterns of life repeatedly and expect to be successful. So I guess I realized at that moment that cannabis kind of, you know, quieted that down and made it to where um, I was a lot more, I guess, functional. But I didn't learn to only use the cannabis until I was about 18 because I did have a strong addiction to uh, stimulant drugs um, from 13 to 18 years old. And then when I got off of those, you know, my grades improved, my interpersonal skills improved, my um, ability to see projects all the way through and not just worry about fucking getting high as shit, like improved, you know, it's a, it's a big mind state change. So shout out to the weed for being the maintenance thing. But I think what's more interesting is um, what's more interesting is like kind of the psychedelics because those really the weed I guess changed my life, but it really didn't change anything. It just sort of like maybe it's given me an easy way out of sorts in terms of like dealing with ADHD symptoms. But God damn it, they're so pervasive and frustrating and really difficult to deal with on a day to day basis for anyone that actually does deal with that and knows what knows what's going on with that you understand how what it's like to live in that brain and so you know they give you fucking amphetamines to try and deal with it sorry excuse my language but uh i think the cannabis works a lot better for me personally mm. yeah so the psychedelics though that was oh, i want to say now you shouldn't do psychedelics at 15 what 14 15 i, I want to say i want to say i was 15 and you shouldn't do them that young, uh, first of all. But, you know, I was just in an environment where things are available. 
and uh you know it's just what it was at that time so um we took the mushrooms that so the first thing i did was psilocybin um we took the mushrooms and soaked them in lemon juice because i read that it makes it stronger or whatever on the internet and it, it what it does is it kind of makes it kick in quicker like uh, oh. Yeah, uh, the citric acid in the lemon juice converts the psilocybin to psilocin, which is the active drug. Um, it So it basically just decarboxylates it, which cleaves off. Well, no, I guess it doesn't decarb it. It kind of just cleaves off an oxygen and a hydrogen molecule and makes it a lot more bioavailable. So it kicks in a lot quicker. And it's digestible uh, in some sense or it yeah. can digest quicker slash break down quicker. Yes, it enters the body faster and gets your brain mm-hmm. doing all types of fun things a lot quicker. Is is the main gist for those of y'all listening out there. So chop your grind your shrooms up, soak them in lemon juice for twenty minutes in the fridge, and then uh, strain out the mushrooms, drink the liquid, and then try to like eat the mushrooms as best you can, and put your seatbelt on even if you're sitting on the couch. But um, yeah, so we did that, and I remember walking down the street to. Uh, we were going down to this park that's in uh, Louisville. It's called Cherokee Park, and it's a really beautiful place. It's an Olmstead Park, which for those of y'all that are familiar with uh, Olmstead Parks, he's the guy that uh, created uh, Central Park in New York City. And so mm-hmm. Louisville is actually really lucky where we've gotten several Olmstead Parks in our city as well, um, huh. which are they're really, really well-designed, beautiful, well-integrated with the city. So it's like, you know, you can kind of just walk all, you can spend the whole day in the park, basically. It's beautiful. And so um, we're walking around, walking around, and I just remember becoming so fascinated with the concept of a pocket and knowing that everything... Like a closed pocket or like a different kind of pocket? uh, Yes, a closed pocket, but everything is a pocket that contains itself. Uh, and I realized that we were all just in this, like everything is a pocket. I don't know how to elaborate on that quite much more, but it made so much sense at the time. And I realized, I think that's the, that's a young brain making sense of the all is one type of experience mm. that you're getting. Like I felt like I was connected to the fabric of everything and that everything held itself and that, you know, it's not like I was separate from anything. I lost all sense of separation from my external reality and my consciousness and my body. It's like, you know, normally we're aware that our body is different from the chair that I'm sitting on or the computer that I'm looking at. But in that, in that instance, you know, I, I was just pure consciousness, pure awareness, connected to everything, realizing that I was everything, that there was no me or you i guess in this instance you know we're all just energy doing its thing um which is a very cliche thing to say you know i feel like that's kind of what most people come to realize on psychedelics is that we're all just kind of like every everything's connected through energy and you know the molecules are all connected by energy but they're never actually touching and it's a you know it's a it's a wild thing so after that we're walking around walking around and we're walking up by this creek, and I just remember, um, and there's a tree, and we've got these cars coming up the side of the road, and the sound that the cars would make felt like a tsunami that just, it would just overtake my entire existence, and I, I got to a point where I felt my consciousness get dragged out of my skull down into the right, into the ground. And I just sat down beside this tree and closed my eyes. And for the next, I'm not sure, amount of time, um, it could have been, I would say, in, in Earth minutes, probably 15 to 20 minutes we were sitting there. And I just remember seeing just indescribable. Uh, it's, it's, it's just like data, almost, you know, that, that our brain is intercepting from from the way it's like i was inter- inter- intercepting all this cosmic data that's just flying around and i downloaded a bunch of stuff into my brain and then i realized how um it's like once the download happened 
which is how it felt. It felt like a lot of something got interjected into my consciousness via the mushrooms. Um, ah, that's a, you know, even, even 12, 11 years ago now, like when I still, I can still feel that feeling. It's a very strange thing when I think about it. Um, yeah, we're just sitting there and eventually I decided to stand up because my buddy that I was with had kept hitting this stick on the ground and it was causing like earthquakes every time he would hit the stick. And, um, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. So I was like, all right, we gotta, we gotta just do something. So I was like, I guess I gotta leave this little area where I'm sitting because it's getting a little like heavy. And when I stood up, I instantly just felt more like I kept, I, I kept having a thought loop of the word mature and like, I couldn't escape that word in my brain. It's like that word was what the focus was for the next hour and a half. And then we made it slowly back to my house and uh, we were playing basketball in the backyard coming down and I was watching, you know, it's like I had shot tracer on, but uh, you know, just in, in real life. And that shit was really cool. You know, the fall was making tracers and all that. So I, I did get some of those fun classical psychedelic effects. And of course, you know, Paisley patterns everywhere I look and like just the texture of everything is, is mm. soupy, but ripply. Uh, oh yeah. Just, it, it's, it's kind of like a visual soup. It's like how mm -hmm. I like to describe it. But yeah, it was a very, a very maturing experience. And ever since mm. then, um, on, on, when I take the mushrooms, I always get that same kind of feeling of like a cosmic download. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I, and then, like you said, an important part of that is also the w days and weeks after it's like, what can we integrate from this experience? Yeah, it's not just learn. about what happens then. Yeah. But mm -hmm. keep going. No, you're good. I didn't learn how to do that at that age. And so mm. what was interesting is that, um, I kept diving deeper and deeper and deeper because that first trip really wasn't the one that like made me realize what the potential of it was. You know, huh. that just kind of like got in the, I just understood that mushrooms had an activity at that. Yeah. Point. Like there was something going on, but mm -hmm. you know, you're not educated at that age and there's no guidance system. Like you would find in other cultures where you have people yeah. um, who are older, who, are able to say, Hey, this is kind of what's going on. You know, mm -hmm. I was just kind of left it up to my own devices to interpret something that is vastly beyond my pay grade as a fucking 15 year old. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. And that's why I'm kind of a fan of like it becoming decriminalized. And there's some like center centers where you can go with to a shaman or, you know, a person who's mm -hmm. experienced and they can walk you through it. They can be there. They can, be that guide and you know no one really has that in a society where it's all you know illegal but right you can still find people still but it, my hope is that more people can go to these environments and and really see the potential of them mm -hmm. and my hope as well with that which i i think is a great thing that there are places where you can go and have facilitated experiences um my worry with that is that mm. Uh, because of the nature of the lack of societal integration with these compounds, I just, I worry about the quality of care and guidance that these people re will receive who are oftentimes reaching out to these centers because they are in a place of fear or pain. Uh, they're not necessarily just like, hey, I'm going to try psychedelics because Open my you know, mind. I'm in a good mood. They're thinking, oh, I need I, like I need something to therapy. Help. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so oh, it gets, I see I see your side. Of, I, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I see. Because I've, I've yeah. had to help people through very difficult, like trauma opening type of experiences on psychedelics before. And it's something where you have to have a very deep resolve within yourself and to understand and know, especially while you're tripping, if you're, you yourself are also tripping. So one thing I'd hope that these people are not, which I'd assume that they're not tripping with the patient. Probably not. But yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's, it's very, when someone is in a loop, which I don't, have you ever had to deal with someone in a loop? 
where they're. Just... I might have been in a loop also. Yeah, oh, I've yeah. Been, yeah, I've been in, I've been in a few where it's uh you're kind of almost you almost can't be reached in a sense. In some ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to know how to be able to keep a person physically safe through that. Um, and also understanding like they might do some really wild off the wall shit that is just uncalled for and societally not normal, but you better be okay with it. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. I could, Hey, listen, I could tell that's been, co- that's been a long time. Yeah. Coming. Uh, there we go. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, yeah, the things with like using psychedelics in those centers to, uh, work through trauma and pain because I, that I will say that is, I, I believe the best use for them as our, for our species, um, you know, to help get a, people get through trauma and pain. And yeah. To deal with that's life. what, that's what they've helped me with, you know, especially over the past couple of years. Um, you know, I've had a lot of different things happen throughout my life where, uh, you know, I guess people would categorize it as not easy um i look at it as my life at this point where i try not to attach a good or bad to it that's what um that's what ketamine helped me do but ketamine's a weird one and you know that's not really the focus of of what this is there's a lot of other resources out there and podcasts with information on you know how ketamine helps people but in my opinion the the tryptamines and and psychedelics dmt i will say helped me out a lot with trauma um as well and DMT, you know, made me, uh, not made me, but I, I was smoking it um, at a low dose, which was, I was experimenting with sustained low dose DMT, where you just take like small hits of it every 10 minutes. And it's kind of like smoking mushrooms where you can like go up or down, depending on like how you want to, uh, how intense you want the trip to be. But it's got a different feeling. It's got a different energy. And interesting. Um, yeah, so that one, I, I had a another download, but it felt different. And it said something just was like, you're never going to consume alcohol again in your life. And so it's been like, I want to say, not that I, I never had an addiction with alcohol either, because I never, I'm not a downer person and I never cared for drugs that uh, suppress the like central nervous system. Um, I want my reality to go burr, not the other way around. Uh, mm. I think that... Um, Oh, yeah. Where was I going with this? The the the, the DMT really no kind of like. You said I'm sorry. What'd you say? Oh, like no elk. The the DMT told you. Oh, I don't want you to drink anymore. Or yeah, you yeah, said yeah, to yourself. Yeah. That uh, and and I've stuck to that, you know. And it's never. It's not really a an issue for me. But I guess because I've got other things like you know weed and I'll eat like sure. uh every once in a while you get a little mushroom cap and then. Maybe I'll mm-hmm. eat like a little bit of mescaline. I do like sporadic microdosing where you don't follow necessarily a regimen and allowing your body to kind of like recover from the stimulation of the, of the, uh, you know, the receptors in the, in the body and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really wonderful thing. Yeah. Man, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I definitely will have to check out a few more of the things you've mentioned, but I guess what, what would you say you might've already said it, but what would you say your biggest takeaway from psychedelics as a whole was or is? Okay. So this is, this would be a good way to kind of like surmise this whole thing. My Mm -hmm. biggest way, my biggest takeaway from using psychedelics personally is that you need to always understand that you'll never be able to understand what's going on in the world and that you need to just try your best to consistently move forward with what you think is best. There is no right. There is no wrong. There is no good. There is no bad. All that there is, is the second that you're existing in right now and your memories and your ideas for what you can possibly be. Everything else doesn't really matter. It's extraneous. And, you know, that's only from my experience, and that only applies to me. So, really, this is, I wanted to say this because this is really what the takeaway is. Psychedelics will do what they need to do for you, not what you want them to do for you. Interesting. You know, someone might have a 
oh, my goal with these psychedelics is to do this. And it's like, well, <laughs> you're not in charge here. Nope. You know, the mushrooms are in charge. You know, the universe is kind of in charge, and you're kind of along for the ride when yeah. you sign the contract. And the, you more you, uh, the more you try and understand it, the more you, uh, you know, it's like, a, it's like Hunter S. Thompson's lawyer said, you know, don't try and fight it, you'll get brain bubbles. Which brain bubbles aren't real, but you know it's a, it's a metaphor for like having an accepting, like a consistent accepting experience, is the best way that I can put that uh, psychedelics have benefited me. But also, you know, it could just be how I have grown to see the world through all of the experiences that I've had. Maybe psychedelics just help you uh, see the light and some strange places man that's well said i guess final question what would you say to someone who might have f listened to this whole thing but has never tried any of the thing like weed or psychedelics like what would you say to them like would you say that they should try it would you say like what what's your advice to someone who's really skeptical of even thinking about this whole thing okay well i'm glad and i'm glad that you asked that because i also want to uh say that I'm in no way saying you should go out there and ingest these substances for yourself. What I, all I want people to do, um, anyone that is interested in experiencing or learning about psychedelics, is hit the books, hit the internet, try and educate yourself as much as possible before making that leap. Understanding at the same time that no matter what you read, no matter how much you try and prepare yourself as well, you really won't be prepared for what will happen. Um, just know that the best thing you can do is go into it with continuous acceptance. And, you know, put a smile on your face because you got the power to put a smile on your face and you wouldn't believe what that could do. Um, that's all I could really say to someone who's thinking about trying these. You know, just, and be safe. Don't, don't drive a car. <laughs> yeah man that's really motivational and i love that oh and yeah, also you know i want to i want to just give people like a little uh saying to live by as well mm. with, with the drugs you know uh, they're that they're tools and you can either use them to build a house or cut your hand off it's all up to how you decide to do it and how you decide to apply your education on the topic man these are great wow I love that, you know. It's you know, like, I'm, I'm trying used. to, I'm trying to give you some good, like, clippable things. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've been, I've been taking notes. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> no, that's amazing. Oh, that's yeah, man, I really appreciate you coming on. That I learned so much. I want to keep this relationship going and maybe have another discussion in the future about maybe oh. another one of the specifics. You Listen, know, any, substances. Any, anything that you are interested in that you would like to know, I'm an open book and I've had, I've been around the block a few times, you know, so I've got real world experience combined with academic experience in this field. And I think that, uh, you know, you can't lose when you got that going on. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. It means a lot. Well, listen, I appreciate you having me on here and, uh, you know, make sure, uh, make sure y'all keep checking out this man's podcast right here for those of y'all out there listening a uh, lot of great, a lot of great knowledge being spread out here. So, you know, keep listening, keep absorbing and keep having a uh, positive day. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Check out his as well. I'll throw all the links in the description. So, yeah.